OK, hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's MOBEX webinar, which is brought to you with our knowledge partner KPIT. My name is Freddie Holmes. I'm part of the editorial team here at Automotive World, and I'll be your host. Today's, uh, today's session will discuss how you can fast track a career in automotive software with the help of KPIT. KPIT is a software development partner to global automakers and suppliers, helping them develop the next generation of autonomous electric and connected vehicles. As the automotive sector becomes increasingly reliant on software, this is creating many new opportunities for software engineers to get involved. Walking us through this in more detail will be Omka Panse, Vice President and Head of Middleware Solutions at KPIT, who will introduce himself shortly. Before that, though, let's take a quick look at how this is all going to go. Over the next hour, Omkar will discuss how software is disrupting the automotive industry and the kind of challenges and opportunities this change presents. Importantly, we'll also be discussing how you can build a career in this sector and how KPIT can help to nurture new talent entering the automotive field. Keep in mind that there are various roles open at KPIT right now and that the company is actively looking to bring new expertise on board. There'll be a chance for some audience Q&A at the end, so do send in your questions and we will get through as many as we can in the time remaining. You can ask a question at any time by typing it into the Q&A box at the top of your screen. With housekeeping out of the way, I will hand over to Omkar, who will get us started. Omkar, over to you. Uh, thank you, Freddie. I um, appreciate the introduction. Uh, welcome to everyone to this webinar uh, uh, today, uh, where we will discuss uh, how you can fast track your career, uh, especially in the automotive track and with KPIT. Uh, before we dive in, just quick introduction from my side. Uh, uh, I've spent about 22 years at KPIT now. Uh, I joined here uh, uh, almost when I was uh, three, four years out of engineering school. Uh, uh, and the primary reason I switched to KPIT was I wanted to uh, work on a language that has pointers. That's basically C and C++. And that was, uh, that was the motivation. And prior to that, uh, I was doing a lot of uh, CAD customization in AutoLisp and a couple of other areas because I'm a mechanical engineer by education. Uh, but uh, uh, although at that point in time, KPIT was not uh, such a well-known name at, as it is today in the automotive software, nonetheless, we are doing quite a bunch of interesting work. Um, um, so I've spent 22 years here. I've looked at various uh, strategic initiatives at KPIT. I've been responsible for a couple of large software platform initiatives. I've handled also one uh, direct-to-consumer product at KPIT, uh, played a business leader role for the cloud connectivity solutions, and currently I'm responsible for the middleware software, uh, which is a very important st strategic initiative focused on the future uh, vehicles, what we know as the software-defined vehicles. Um, and that's that's what the centerpiece of the topic today. So with that, uh, let's uh, drive into our topic today. Um, just a quick outline of what we will be discussing. Uh, we'll of course look at, uh, uh, we'll, we'll start at evolution of uh, the software in the cars and you know, what is what is widely known as case mega trends. Uh, the reason we, I want to talk about it is because a lot of participants in the audience uh, uh, are probably from uh, non-automotive companies, non-automotive software companies. Uh, there are participants from various different adjacent industries and domains. So I thought uh, it will be interesting for you to understand uh, how uh, the you know, software in the cars has evolved and what what all this case mega trends is all about. Uh, we'll also talk about how that is driving the change in the electronic architecture inside the car. How does it look like in the first place and how is it rapidly evolving into something uh, quite dramatically different what it has been so far. Um, uh, with that, we will kind of then look at uh, how the movement towards so-called software-defined vehicles is happening um, and uh, what does it entail, why is it happening, you know, we'll discuss all of that. We'll then, of course, touch upon the important part about what are the technical expertise uh, are which are relevant to kind of fill in um, the opportunity over here. Uh, and I think this is something probably you will find uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about KPIT, you know, what is our ethos and what we are known for and how do we work. 
and uh, of course then we'll talk about uh, specific opportunities and the progression track uh, at uh, kp8 in the context of software defined vehicles and of course towards the end we will will take questions um, uh, so that's that's just brief an overview about what what we're going to talk about today <clears throat> As you can see uh, in the in this particular slide over here, you know the cars have been around for hundreds of years, right? I mean, in you know, 1886, probably the first car was invented and built, uh, but the successful mass production happened in 1950. But still, 1950 till today, it's, it's a very long, very very long time, um, and and the cars have evolved rapidly. Uh, and what earlier, if you look at earlier cars way back then. They were um, they were largely a mechanical piece of uh, a machinery, you know, an equipment, uh, and uh, um, they were of course uh, not efficient engines. So they were largely mechanically controlled devices running at low speeds, and that's what characterized it. And obviously, the the engineering piece that surrounded it was obviously also largely mechanical, and few other disciplines which are real, you know, which are dominant in terms of how the engine operates. But as as things progressed, you know the uh, the focus shifted towards the safety of cars. The focus shifted towards the comfort of cars. The focus shifted towards um, uh, fuel efficiency uh, of the cars, so on and so forth. And very soon, uh, the realization set in that uh, you can do so much with mechanical systems, um, and uh, that is where the control systems were uh, on the rise. So the confluence of and uh, electronic uh, progression in electronics uh, circuitry, you know, rise of semiconductors, rise of internal circuit, uh, the, the IC chips, uh, together with uh, sensors and actuators, gave rise to first early software, and uh, that is what I think the content in soft cars kind of started changing dramatically. So if you fast forward to 2000, we already had cars which had electronic ABS, which had electric windows and digital dashboard and whatnot. But uh, as keeping in line with Moon's law, the way the electronics has progressed, the way the semiconductors have progressed, the contents inside the cars have also risen dramatically from a software perspective. Uh, but by the end of 2010, we were already seeing driver assist features coming into cars. What it means is you could be driving on the highway and you could just hit a button uh, to keep driving, let's say at 70 kilometers per hour, and the car will do the rest. You all, all you need to do is just put your hands on the steering wheel. So underlying software and electronics is driving the car for you essentially. Then we saw the rise of navigation systems, the hybrid cars, uh, the you know, the Bluetooth smartphone connectivity, and so on and so forth. And by the end of 2020, all of us know where Tesla Motors today is. Tesla is already out with autopilot, which is uh, which is a radically advanced uh, self-driving autonomous driving features and then you have hotspots in the car you have large screens and whatnot and by 2030 we are already now looking at uh, cars which will be significantly self-driving uh, and probably largely electric uh, cars uh, that will come our way so within the span of these uh, last 70 75 years um, uh, the, the profile of the technology inside the car has dramatically changed the content uh, and the software content that is inside the car has dramatically changed and it is changing to the extent that uh, uh, we, are, we are almost about to kind of start making our decisions of which car to buy based on the software and not only in terms of how the engine performs and then some of the traditional parameters that we have been using so far. What is driving this car is obviously the demand for the cleaner, smarter, and safer vehicles. Um, obviously, all of us are know are aware about uh, the climate change scenario that we are all facing. Uh, we need cleaner cars for sure. We need safer cars for sure. If you look at India alone, uh, <laughs> keep aside the easy years, the last couple of years of COVID, but otherwise, the number of deaths that happen in India because of road accidents is excess of 150,000 people per year, and that's a that's a very very high number. So you definitely need safer vehicles, not just here and but globally. And of course, you need smarter cars because uh, a smarter car allows you to make a better utilization of your time, of your commute. Um, and that's what brings us to the case trains. And case basically starts for connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. 
and as you can see some of the important statistics here almost 77% of the vehicles on the global roads will be connected by end of 2030 and by connected we mean not just uh, connected to your phone but connected to the cloud uh, connected via the telematics device to open up variety of interesting use cases so almost 77% of the cars will be connected almost 15% of the new cars will be autonomous and that's an impressive uh, jump from where we are today 9% uh, cars will be shared so shared mobility is what we see the likes of uber and lyft and ola etc and that's a dominant uh, that dominant mechanism or dominant way of how people are commuting and how people are actually using the cars in fact global trends are showing that the uh, the, the 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 sales of new cars are declining and more and more people are actually shifting to sharing the cars rather than buying for individual ownership and of course the electric vehicle uh, there is an estimate that almost 145 million new cars will be electric by 2030 so that's what basically means the case trends uh, for us connected autonomous shared and electric so as the content started increasing now there is a, a radical shift in now we are looking at it through the lens of the case trends and then we are looking at what does it mean to really own and experience the car as we get from point a to point b so the future cars will now therefore be significantly defined by the the software features and not just the hardware features and there are two important reasons for that one is the shift to the electric cars as uh, some of you who are probably already in the automotive background and some of you who are mechanical engineers may know that an internal combustion engine is a very complex piece of machinery it has thousands of moving parts compared to that if you look at electric cars electric cars probably have uh, very few moving parts and there is an estimate that uh, electric cars uh, will get rid of almost 1000 1500 moving parts so so the car is getting going to get simplified radically not just that the fundamental driving experience will itself be software controlled because with a motor you can now vary the speed infinitely so you don't need complex gearboxes you don't need a lot of complex um, equipment around that you know a simple piece of software can do wonders over here in terms of your driving experience so the in vehicle world today is going to get characterized by how do you experience the navigation how do you experience music can you project the contents of the phone inside your car screen the electric mobility autonomous driving etc and that is rapidly getting combined together with your connected and digital world which is an outside the car world so our life outside the car is defined largely around our mobile phones and we use mobile phone almost for everything from buying things to looking up for parking places to booking you know ordering food or booking a restaurant table to gaming um, uh, to i don't know to making payments and whatnot so there is a fusion of these two worlds which is which is happening rapidly and the future cars will be significantly defined by this software feature content and as you can see here uh, in the earlier days the features were largely built in um, uh, that is native sitting inside the car on a computer inside a car but now that is largely going to be cloud centric or combined between split between the cloud and the car and that's another very very interesting shift uh, uh, that's kind of uh, going to happen um, To put it in perspective from case perspective another interesting um, uh, statistic here is if you if you look at the picture on the right hand side uh, it gives a relative scale of the number of lines of code sitting in that device so if you see an airplane probably airplane has somewhere about 14 million lines of code a, a complex modern airplane um, uh, android code base is probably 15 million lines of code uh, facebook code base the core code base is probably 62 million lines of code uh, and in contrast with that, a typical vehicle today has 100 million lines of code inside it. And there is an estimate that as we move towards autonomous vehicle, this is likely to grow to 300 million lines of code. And that's a substantially large amount of software inside a car, you know, inside any device or machine for that matter. So uh, I think it is quite appropriate to say that the automobiles are actually becoming software on wheels. Uh, and they're also becoming what we we say internally as data center on wheels um, because the experience is defined by the software uh, the experience is uh, 
altered uh, rapidly by the software and the content is largely software driven uh, and 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 therefore it is no surprise that these are largely automobiles are software on wheels and needless to say that uh, all this software con increase in software content is dramatically changing the way the vehicles are engineered the earlier vehicles were as i said engineered with a lot of emphasis on manufacturing the mechanical engineering and the related aspects the electricals the mechanicals and other parts of course the manufacturing focus remains but as you can imagine even the manufacturing is getting simplified with the advent of electric cars but the significant engineering focus is now shifting to how do you write the software how do you how do you deliver the software in, into the car how do you update the software uh, because gone are the days where um, uh, the software that you got in the car was what was there inside the car when you bought it today the expectation is the software gets updated as frequently as possible all of you uh, you know uh, use smartphones and we update our smartphone software quite frequently whenever google releases a new android release or whenever apple releases a new ios release we just go and update it and it just happens the same expectation is kind of going to come from the cars so it is no exaggeration that we are now looking at a totally different way of how the cars will be engineered that brings us to some of the interesting imperatives uh, you know which are falling out of the trends uh, that we talked about over here and uh, uh, as 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 i already mentioned the complexity is radically increasing we're looking at hundreds of millions of lines of code inside the car um we're looking at the need of the hardware and software separation traditionally the software in the car never changed you know in the earlier days then we had a period in between um, your engine was controlled by the software and uh, often times if you took your car back to the servicing one of the one of the activities your technician would do is update the software inside the car by connecting it to the special piece of hardware um, which means the rate at which you can update the software was quite very very slow probably once a year and those updates were also far and few and limited to probably performance update or bug fixes and those kind of things but now we are looking at an expectation of separate the hardware content from the hard, uh, hardware and so software should be separated so that it is possible to deliver new features in a matter of weeks and months and not years and that brings us to the next important imperatives of upgradeability all of us are now expect intuitively that our cars are upgradable we recognize the software content inside the car and with that there is an implicit expectation that i should be able to update the software and i should be able to keep the car refreshed uh, over the period of ownership of the car um, which means that in the earlier days if you bought a car you probably had i don't know with the most advanced navigation system at that point in time but within a matter of year that most advanced system gets outdated but here you have to upgrade it continuously so these are the very very important critical imperatives which uh, come along with the shift that is happening towards software defined vehicles quick word on the electric architecture what is kind of going to happen uh, under the skin uh, and again you you don't need to worry about all the technicalities but what used to happen in the earlier days the cars were characterized by what is called as a distributed architecture so you had braking systems you had engine control systems you had um, the air conditioning you had the lighting control you had the door control you had the remote access system the engine control itself the transmission control each of these were individual ecus or the electronic control units basically a computer built on a microcontroller and each ecu was built for a dedicated specific function and all of these ecus were connected by a special automotive networking bus called as can or controller area network or lin or flexray so these are very automotive specific buses so this architecture did quite well for some time but now as the software content is increasing you can now imagine the complexity it is there when it comes to updating the car when you update the phone you are just updating one device when you have to update the car you have to update these tens of ecus i know a, a, a typical complex car has anywhere up to 70 or 80 ecus inside the car and updating it is quite a bit of a challenge 
that gave way to what is now called as a domain controller architecture where the software is getting consolidated into few bigger computers called as domain controllers so for each functional domain there is a dedicated controller and the software is getting consolidated basically to address the problem of upgradability and now in future we are looking towards a shift of what is called as a central computer based architecture where there will be probably one or two large computers inside the car and some zonal issues to separate uh, separate the network between the central computer and the sensors and actuators and smart sensors and actuators to sense various data and actuators to control the function of the car so that's the shift happening uh, towards uh, uh, shift happening in 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 terms of the architectural change um, obviously this shift and the, the shift in the software content together is kind of dramatically changing things for us and let's look at those in a moment but the key takeaway from this is the architecture inside the car is substantially changing the software content is substantially increasing and uh, um, this is basically driven by the need to keep the car refreshed from a software perspective so what what, what does it really mean by you know these software defined vehicles so the earlier days as i said the cars were largely electromechanical um, um, uh, but they rapidly evolved into the connected um, uh, uh, connected intelligent uh, mobile upgradable devices and this is made possible by the the concept of software defined vehicles and as you as the as the term suggests the behavior of the vehicle the functionality is significantly software defined and it is made possible by a car operating system so you would have probably heard about announcement from Volkswagen announcements from BMW announcements from Stellantis General Motors almost everybody has announced that they will build their own operating system so that operating system essentially comprises these four or five layers you know a common middleware platform to separate the hardware from software harmonization of the apis the edge compute uh, uh, applications which will run on the uh, on the car the continuous software updates and seamless cloud integration the car is almost now becoming an extension of a cloud and there is a expectation that uh, whether you whether you are looking at it through the lens of cloud or whether you're looking at it from the point of your car they are almost like extended to each other what it means is the applications that you create it should be possible to run those applications inside the car it should be possible to run those applications on the cloud or possibly both with an intelligent split of the functionality now you can imagine and if you contrast it with the older architecture which was largely microcontroller based real time operating system based largely written in c now that has given a way to a completely different uh, way how the software gets written so we talked about the change in the software content we talked about the rise in the software content we talked about a shift in the architecture and we talked about the layers which are there in a software defined vehicles and as you can imagine probably now it is no more about a simple embedded system written in c a modern car software is a confluence of multiple interesting technologies and i'll i'll give a minute to this slide and as you can see um, c++ c linux robotic operating system that is ros or open cl open vx virtual validation kubernetes python android ios Py, golang java <laughs> nothing is off limits uh, a modern car software is a concoction of all of these some of this is on the cloud and some of this is on the uh, edge and by edge basically uh, a computer inside the car um, so if you look at a modern software inside a car you will see large part of software written in c++ c is still very very dominant for the control oriented software real time software functionally critical software but we are also seeing technologies like linux we are seeing android inside the car already we are seeing large part of software getting written in either go or lang uh, sorry go or java we are seeing technologies like virtualization we are seeing containerization technologies like docker or kubernetes all the way making it inside the car the reason being uh, as the architecture is getting consolidated uh, if you recall a uh, couple of slides back the central computer as i said the car will have one or two large computers right and these large computers will be built on a multi core massively powerful system on chip or a microprocessor you know comprising probably 8 12 cores 
comprising deep learning accelerators, comprising graphics accelerators, video accelerators, image accelerators. So it's it's basically as powerful or more powerful of the chip that you see on the phones, right? So today, many a times when you buy a phone, except uh, you know if you look at Android phones, a lot of brands will advertise themselves that built on so and so Snapdragon chip, or Apple will announce that you know built on so and so Apple chip, right? So that chip drives all of this. We are seeing equivalent transformation inside the car. A modern computer inside the car is no more a simple microcontroller. It is an extremely powerful multi-core SOC capable of running complex deep deep learning networks, neural nets, and therefore the technology concoction is also changing, which is obviously required to support the functionality that we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, to drive the uh, the modern days uh, cars content. Uh, so let's understand what does it mean for all of you. Um, obviously, the complexity is rising dramatically. Uh, and the technology shift is also happening very, very rapidly. And that is driving a significant demand for the talent uh, in within the automotive space, within the automotive domain. So no more is the case that uh, you need only automotive experience or no more is the case that you need to be only embedded C expert. You can be an expert in any walk of software engineering. And uh, there is uh, uh, there is a pretty good chance that, you know, there is an opportunity in the automotive space whether from a cloud perspective, from an in-vehicle software perspective, connectivity perspective, so on and so forth. Um, and this is driving a significant, significantly high demand in the talent. This is driving a significant pull, uh, significantly uh, different ask, both in terms of the numbers and the skills that the automotive industry needs to meet the challenges of these future software-defined vehicles. So what does it mean, uh, you know, for once again, for all of us here? Um, so perhaps maybe you understood, some of you intuitively understood, probably you have prior automotive experience. So, you know, what does it what does it then mean from a KPIT perspective? What are we doing in this ecosystem? So we'll talk about that. Maybe, maybe you know, um, you want to understand how we kind of onboard the people and, you know, what are the career track inside the KPIT, both from a skill enhancements perspective and uh, uh, you know growth path perspective uh, and of course uh, you know um, uh, you know what impact you will have with your skills so as i talked as i said it, it 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 is a very interesting combination of multiple skills and in fact some of the engineers i personally work with um, you know are conversant with more than one technologies as i mentioned uh, I, I've spent 22 years here at KPIT now, but even even today, the, the the technology play is a significantly high, you know, is a is a dominant aspect in a day to day life, and you have to be kind of be able to switch the switch between the technologies and make the right choices from an architecture perspective, from an implementation perspective. So we'll kind of talk about all of these aspects into the subsequent slides. So few few points about KPIT. Uh, um, some of you may know um, uh, we, we are based out of India. We are headquartered in India and, and, and we are very proud of that. We are probably the largest independent software company who is a partner to this mobility ecosystem. And we are characterized by our vision um, of uh, reimagining the mobility with our customers to create this uh, cleaner, smarter and safer world. And uh, what better place to do that than mobility or than than automotive, right? And you know whether you look at it from a climate perspective, whether you look at it from um, making people's lives smarter, or whether you look at it, look at it from a point of view of making um, you know roads safer. I think that kind of fits bang into what we do in our day-to-day -day life. And of course, um, we talked about how the shift is happening in the in the cars, and we are we are kind of completely in sync with, with with that and we are probably ahead of the curve to help our customers and this is what drives us here at kpit that how we can put together these uh, technologies together uh, to the to better use um, for the benefit of our customers of course while we are headquartered in india we have we have global presence uh, we uh, uh, we are there almost wherever it matters and we'll talk about it uh, in a bit in a subsequent slides and uh, of course, uh, um, uh, what you see here is our headquarter in Pune. It's it's an it's a beautiful building at the at the foot of a hill uh, here in uh, 
phase three, um, but we, we have presence across other locations. So that's our about our vision. Um, we are driven by this singular mission. Uh, we want to be uh, the leading software integration partners to our customers. Um, and we will we will become that by knowing software better than any other auto company or knowing auto better than any other software company. And I think we are almost there. Uh, as I said, we are the largest independent software integration partner to automotive world. What I mean by that is there are a lot of automotive component suppliers, subsystem suppliers, what we call as tier one suppliers. We are not a tier one supplier to any OEM. We are an independent software house uh, powered by our software expertise. And, and we take pride that we know the automotive domain better than any other software company, and we know software better than any auto company. And of course, this is also our mission to continuously strive to stay in that position, because only then uh, we will be known as a trusted integration partner by our customers. And uh, we want to be, we want to be continuously, we want to continuously stay there by becoming a lead, leading company in practices and platforms business. Uh, so we are investing heavily into building a lot of accelerators, a lot of platforms, a lot of underlying technology uh, through what we call as practices. Practice is nothing but a specific focus into different aspects of how uh, the car software and the system is inside the cars are organized. Um, um, of course, by being a best place to grow, um, as I said, uh, me and a lot of my colleagues have spent multiple years here at KPIT. So, and we'll talk about this more into the subsequent slides. And we take pride in zero defect delivery because that is what really, really matters for automotive software. Um, cars are very complex cyber physical systems. So uh, the functional safety aspects and the reliability aspects and the quality required for that is extremely high. And we take pride that uh, we are on our mission uh, towards zero defect deliveries. We of course work with the best in the mobility. And here are some of the logos. This is obviously not an exhaustive list. This is just an indicative list uh, that we work with. Uh, so we work directly with some of these leading car makers or motorcycle uh, manufacturers. And we also work with a lot of their suppliers, a uh, lot of leading large suppliers who are global. Um, so of course, uh, um, we, we, we have to carry the global brand and we have to carry the global expertise to be of relevance and to be of value to these uh, customers and uh, we can we can do that only by deeper engagement with them based on our domain expertise based on the expertise in various technologies that i talked about and by practicing uh, what we believe kind of going to differentiate us from others by continuously investing in these uh, uh, technologies areas on an ongoing basis So this is our global footprint, um, some of our campuses across the globe. So, so we are present where our customers are. So we are present in India, we are present in Pune and Bangalore. We are present um, in big time in Munich. So we have a very large development center in Munich. Uh, it's a beautiful office, almost 700, 800 people office. Um, uh, we also have a large office in US, um, of course, Japan, um, South America. Uh, we are present uh, 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 in a big manner. Um, Bangkok, that's in Thailand, uh, of course, China in Shanghai. So, so we are present wherever our customers are, and we follow that uh, policy quite uh, religiously. So where our customer wants us to be, so we are present there. Uh, and another important reason is uh, it's also the access to the talent pool. We are also in the process of expanding our footprint uh, in other parts of the Europe um, uh, and other parts of some other continents. Uh, so we are a truly we are a truly global company. We we um, bring in global teams. Um, I work with a lot of uh, team members who are spread across the globe, from California to Japan. And of course, uh, the positions and opportunities we are talking about over here, they are also global in nature. So um, it just doesn't matter where you are sitting, and especially all the more in today's days of the post-COVID world, where the location uh, is immaterial. Um, yeah, uh, um, you know, because you can work from wherever you are. Uh, this also helps us to kind of put the best foot forward in terms of what our customer needs. Um, let's also talk about some of the work that we have been doing the, and the underlying technologies that has been kind of driving. So um, these are just three leading examples. For example, we have been investing into these products and solution accelerator development. 
we have been investing into uh, what is called as a middleware development for high performance compute, the central compute that I talked about. We are doing a lot of work on data analytics um, uh, platform for predictive diagnostics. Um, um, and uh, unsurprisingly, as I said, the cloud and car are integrated now. They are deeply connected. Um, uh, so the topics like big data, machine learning, uh, are no more Greek and Latin to automotive domain. We do a lot of work in collecting data, harnessing data, and building interesting applications uh, by using that data, uh, sing, ranging from simple applications like predictive diagnostics to complex scenarios like um, range prediction, battery life prediction, and, and many, many more. If you see from a technology perspective, it, it, it kind of captures some of the technologies you saw on the previous slide, but but a little bit more over here. So we do a lot of work, obviously, on the artosis. We do a lot of work in embedded C, um, cellular V2X or 5G, where there are update technologies, DevOps, CI, CD, et cetera. So these are just some of the glimpses of the work uh, that uh, that we do at KPIT. And there are many, many such projects uh, threads running across the organization, both the internal investment tracks and the customer projects, which offer equally challenging opportunity to do the cutting edge work, to do uh, the work that really stimulates you and to do the work that really kind of, especially if you're an embedded software engineer, what we say that you get the kick out of, so to speak. Um, um, so, uh, and there is ample of that happening across length and breadth of uh, KPIT. We are 7,000 odd engineers uh, as of today, and uh, the only thing we do is automotive software. We don't do any other. We don't do any other vertical. We focus only on the automotive software, and therefore we call our engineers as automobile believers. All of these people are passionate about mobility. These people are passionate about cars. These people are passionate about control systems, and everything else else in between to make this journey on the road as nice and safe as possible for our end customers um as i said we are a global food, we are a global company and we draw talent almost from 25 different nationalities we have 150 strong university association for hiring and upskilling and i'll talk about it a little bit more in the subsequent slides but uh, this is one of the very crucial aspects for us in terms of how do we engage with the academia um uh, how do we kind of keep retraining our people and how do we help them move across the different streams from a skills perspective. We also take in pride that almost 30% of our employees are women employees and a uh, um, uh, lot of our managers, a lot of our leadership team is also kind of coming from there. Our business leaders are represented by women employees. Our uh, technical leaders and architects are represented by women employees and uh, they play a critical role in the overall growth and the, 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 the journey that we have kind of undertaken uh, as a part of this process in becoming the leading software integration partner <clears throat> to our customers. So let's talk a uh, little bit about the growth path at the KPIT. As, as you would have seen, um, our focus is on squarely on this upcoming trend of software defined vehicles. And these software defined vehicles are characterized by this concoction of technologies this complexity of uh, multi-core SOCs, this complexity of combination of multiple uh, operating paradigms, multiple software partitions, uh, um, uh, technologies like gigabit Ethernet and whatnot. So from our perspective, whether you are a developer <coughs> or a tech lead or an architect today already, you are you will find equally inspiring and equally exciting opportunity at KPIT that will uh, give exposure to you to diverse set of technologies. Um, for example, if you are an engineer in the telecom domain um, who has experience in QNX, um, you'll be happy to know that QNX is one of the most preferred operating systems in, in the automotive space today when it comes to writing uh, uh, safety critical software for the software defined vehicles uh, or whether let's say you are a c++ developer in medical electronics c++ uh, uh, probably will be uh, used across 70 80 percent of the software that will get written for new cars so c++ is at a front and center of uh, the skill that is required if you are passionate about linux linux dominates 
the automotive space through the uh, through in the context of connectivity to the cloud, then uh, the edge compute platform, uh, then obviously Android because at the core Android is Linux kernel. Uh, if you're Android engineers, as I said, Android-based infotainment is a critical pass part of uh, you know the automotive architecture. Um, and of course, if you're already part of automotive ecosystem, you probably would already be familiar with other aspects like AutoSAR and Adaptive AutoSAR, and all of that is extremely relevant. So it does not matter what domain you are working with today. It does not matter whether you are an embedded C engineer or whether you are a C++ engineer or uh, you carry varied experience. Um, we are looking at a breadth of uh, expertise and breadth of uh, experience. Um, and it also shows a long progression from developers to architects. So as I said, you know, um, this is my 23rd year now at KPIT. I started as a developer, but uh, um, I moved through different layers. Uh, uh, and I've, I've, the only reason that kept me going is the deep focus on the technology. Uh, and never I worked on the same thing for more than two to three years. Every three years, there has been a new space, the new sphere, new technology area, or a new domain or a new problem to be solved. And that's what kind of has kept me going personally. And uh, you can, if you if you are a techie at heart, uh, that's what probably could be with you, uh, case with you also. And of course, there is a deep uh, hierarchy even beyond the architect's role, something like principal, arch principal architect and then the chief architect growing all the way up to product management and potentially also into the CTO role. So we have a very, very long and deep uh, hierarchy even on the technical side. And as I said, uh, whether you are coming in as a developer or whether you are coming in as technical leaders, you are welcome on board and you are welcome to be part of this journey irrespective of the current domain that you have been a part of. And whether you just know C or C++, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it does not matter. Uh, and why it does not matter is also because we, we offer this opportunity as the best place to grow and creating the net new talent uh, through a rigorous and comprehensive uh, training program, uh, comprehensive uh, initiatives to kind of harness the innovation um, inside the KPIT, um, working continuously on the new age challenges. Uh, we also have a quite mature competency management and competency development framework for continuously upskilling across the board, across the roles, um, which helps kind of also provide uh, fast paced growth um, to our employees, to our colleagues, and very, very strong uh, global of academia collaboration. For example, we have a deep partnership with uh, Coventry University in UK, um, where we, we run the master's program jointly. We have defined the syllabus, um, and, and, and I think they run the master's program in the technical stream, in the management stream. Similarly, our deep partnership with Udacity for running multiple advanced technology training courses, our own internal uh, learning uh, organization called as eCode, and of course, KPIT Sparkle. Uh, some of you who are probably young engineers may have heard about it. It is one of the kind um, uh, uh, contests within, in, held within India where uh, the engineers can come in and uh, uh, basically the you know the students can come in and participate in this competition to bring exciting projects to the fruition and uh, demonstrate it on a on a india wide large platform um, so as i said even if you are coming with a certain skill uh, there is a comprehensive framework to get cross trained to get trained onto the new area or a different area uh, whether to move laterally or whether to move to the next role um, uh, for example, you know, uh, specific specialized training to understand, for example, let's say design principles, object oriented design, modeling technologies, so on and so forth. So there's a well defined structure and there is a well defined focus to help people move continuously to kind of make sure that you are not stagnant and you're not working on the same thing for years and years together. I personally, as I said, every three, four years I've switched technologies and you know I've I've kind of changed. Uh, so personally, from my perspective, whether 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 we are talking of a embedded C based implementation for a 16 bit microcontroller to let's say a large scale cloud deployment uh, um, uh, based on um, you know uh, uh, Azure or AWS uh, and, and building a scalable cloud you know it just doesn't matter you know I can deal with that in the same breath and 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 that's what kind of would uh, also help you grow 
uh, 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 especially as you kind of mature towards becoming an architect where you are expected to know more technologies and you are expected to kind of apply that and there is an ample opportunity um, to do the same. So that's in terms of how, how do we handle and nurture the talent and this is the key so, or this is the centerpiece of the whole journey of KPIT uh, because only by doing this we can support our customers in the most effective manner and only by doing this we can stay ahead of the curve in terms of the investments that we want to do into the new technologies areas and uh, investments we want to do into um, the R&D and into the pilot implementations and of course running myriad customer projects. Um, what, what, what is the life at KPIT like? And you might be curious about it. So what exemplifies the culture at KPIT is essentially continuous learning that I talked about on the previous slide. Sharing knowledge. Uh, so we take pride uh, in a lot of uh, internal forums that we run effectively to share knowledge effectively with employees, with peers, with other teams. We lot of we run a lot of internal contests like I can crack it where you can pose the challenge and people can come and solve it or you you know managing the knowledge management uh, running the knowledge management systems etc uh, keeping commitments both the commitments to the customers and keep it main keep commitment to fellow colleagues and peers and of course celebrating success so so we work hard and we party hard um, uh, and 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 it's definitely definitely hard work you know um, embedded systems by definition are more complex and the software defined vehicles and the complexity we are staring at is by far very, very complex. So it demands certain different degree of hard work and it, it, it therefore needs that you also unwind on weekends and you celebrate the success. So this is what kind of exemplifies uh, life at KPIT. That brings to me to last slide. Uh, hope I could give you some glimpse into how the world of software defined vehicles is how the technology shift is happening, how the how the skills, underlying skills, which are changing dramatically, and the roles that it is opening up at KPIT. Uh, so I really appreciate your patience and I thank you for your time today. Um, uh, if you still have uh, more questions, uh, feel free to ask your questions, ask away um, those questions. Uh, you can also, of course, write to us. And of course, uh, um, you can apply at the link that you see over here um, and you can post your resume at this particular link. So with that, uh, um, we are open for any questions. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Omka. Uh, we've got a bit of time now for Q&A, so do get your questions in. You can send those through the Q&A box. It's at the top of your screen. Uh, just type it in and we will put the question to Omka. Um, thank you to the questions that have come in already. Uh, Omka, let's uh, get straight into the first one here. There's a bit of a um, a, a broad one to start with. Um, in which locations are we seeing job openings? So maybe we could split that between, uh, I guess, locations within India and then secondly, outside of India. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, so of course, as I said, uh, current openings that we are looking at, these are global openings. So we have within India, we are looking at uh, adding team members both in Pune and Bangalore, where we have a large presence. And we are also uh, looking at uh, openings in Munich, uh, in Germany, in US, and uh, of course Japan. Uh, so if you if you just were to look at uh, split, probably India maybe 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 70, 80 percent will be still India. But uh, we are also looking at other locations where uh, we are running our initiatives as well as customer projects. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, Another question here, uh, which skill sets will be helpful for getting a job in the automotive scenarios outlined today? Sure, thanks. That's a great question. And I, I hope uh, I could kind of answer that to my um, presentation. But just to go back to that, uh, while in the earlier days, the primary skill has been C or embedded C. As you can see, C++ today dominates the scenario almost 70% of the software will be C++. So C and C++, they continue to be the mainstream technologies for the onboard software. Uh, but what I mean by onboard software is the software that goes inside the car. But along with that, we are looking at onboard technologies like Linux, uh, Linux BSP development, Linux device driver development, QNX BSP, QNX programming, uh, AutoSAR, Adaptive AutoSAR. Uh, also um, exposure to containerization technologies like Kubernetes or Dockers, so on and so forth. 
uh, we are seeing some implementations inside the car happening also in uh, go or uh, golang or or let's say python uh, from a from an offboard perspective uh, i mean all the all the cloud native technologies are very very relevant we are doing lot of development of tools and accelerators which are cloud based but which are critical for software defined vehicles so even if you are a cloud expert uh, whether you are a cloud engineer or cloud front end developer full stack developer java developer python developer all these skills are relevant in a software defined vehicle context fantastic thank you uh, we got a question through on data analytics uh, one listener asks could you discuss the kind of data analytics applications that are currently in place in automotive certainly um as i said uh, the modern cars are characterized by software and they are also equally characterized by the large number of data that they generate uh, to give you a, give you a simple idea in the earlier days the cars um, had very very primitive sensors but the modern car has lot of sensors especially as we start looking at autonomous car so camera is a very common sensor in the cars now temperature sensors environment sensors rain sensors and of course fundamental sensors like speed acceleration and all that right um so the car generates a large amount of data every minute that you drive uh so we are looking at variety of applications based on big data and analytics ranging from <clears throat> predicting when your next servicing is due so gone are the days where you have to look at like i have to service my car every 5000 10000 miles or kilometers the car will tell you what when to service it and what to service so you know Uh, it is going to that extent also there are very interesting uh, applications coming up which is which are a mash up of let's say location data and a vehicle data for example for uh, one of the leading motorcycle manufacturer we are building use cases that when you are driving your motorcycle on a leisure trip the motorcycle will tell you that it is better to make a stop at the next fuel pump because one after that is far away so it knows the where is the fuel station and what is the current fuel level so it combines that data performs analytics and gives you this insight so there are many many examples and uh, this is becoming one of the mainstream uh, areas of uh, data driven features through which the car makers are also looking to earn continued revenue uh, also going beyond the sales of the car right so we you will see more and more installable applications coming into the car which will be using the data from the car and delivering value back to you as a consumer fantastic thank you uh, another broad sort of industry question here ronka um what is the future of automotive software testing okay great question again um in the earlier days the cars were sick, largely uh, largely content control systems right you know for to control your engine and to control your brakes and uh, control systems were getting tested uh, through what is called as a hardware in loop testing and it had specialized equipment and a way of testing the cars and of course all the traditional way of testing the software are very very relevant so whether you are looking at unit testing or white box testing to the functional testing regression testing etc but then there are some specialized testing required like hardware in loop testing what is called as a soak testing and many more but if you look at the future the future is very very exciting we are doing lot of work in what is called as a virtualization or virtualization for validation so we are looking at technologies where you can validate your software even when the even if the hardware is not built or even if the hardware is not available so virtualization technologies and virtualizing your software to perform functional testing to perform integration testing in the absence of hardware is one of the key areas another frontier in testing is the testing of the connected experience um, uh, to give you a sense um, you know you would have seen advertisements uh, of some of the car brands where you can be sitting at home where you can speak to your uh, a device like let's say amazon echo and you could say probably alexa turn on the air conditioning and many many such examples if you if you complete the chain uh, you know there are many many layers coming in the play so the future of the testing will also have to address how do you test your cloud services how do you test your connectivity interfaces how do you test your smartphones so that also dramatically changing how the test automation will happening so it is very very exciting and testing and testing automation alone is is a very exciting and complex emerging area
Thank you. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, interesting question here. Um, when would it be ideal to switch from mechanical engineering to software engineering? And again, they've, they've asked um, what kind of skill sets can a mechanical engineer start with to gain entry into software? Yes, uh, I can tell by my example. Um, I'm myself a mechanical engineer, so there is never a bad time to make a switch, honestly. Um, but uh, um, so that's on a lighter note. But uh, uh, you could be making switch into testing. You could be making switch into algorithm development, control system development, or general broader software development. Um, from a control system perspective, obviously, uh, because you understand how the mechanics works and how engines works, you know, that gives kind of natural probably advantage, if I may say. But control systems is one of the dominant area where the switch could happen. But typically, um, we have seen a lot of domain experts coming in as what we call as a system engineering aspects or a requirements management aspect where you have to understand the high level requirements and you have to translate those into the software requirements or specification. And it, and it is a very specialized system engineering uh, activity. So uh, there is never a bad time to switch and there are multiple roles into which the switch could happen. And depending on that, the skills could vary from simple basic uh, embedded C programming to control software development using or, or let's say understanding and learning modeling tools like MATLAB Simulink to let's say uh, learning tools like DOORS and SysML for requirements engineering to let's say uh, uh, learning test automation technologies if you want to focus on testing. So there is a broad possibility and of course each has its own demand for a specific skill. And we've been talking a lot about uh, what an existing engineer or an existing professional can do um, to get into software. Uh, but one listener has asked, what sort of skills can an intern or a student focus on in order to progress their career in this domain? Great question again. Um, so we work with a lot of interns ourselves, and uh, um, I would divide that broadly into two or three buckets. First bucket is uh, uh, the onboard software. So onboard software typically uh, uh, experience or or any any know how with Linux programming and C C plus plus is a great starting point. Um, uh, the second bucket could be a, uh, offboard software, and offboard software again has two parts. Uh, one is cloud, and second is data science. We are doing large work in data science or applications of uh, um, either. Uh, writing algorithms uh, based on cloud or deep learning technologies. So again, all those skills are quite relevant. So Python it becomes therefore another important skill, uh, Python or any other equivalent language. And of course, uh, cloud technologies such as uh, front end development, Java programming, um, full stack, etc. So as an intern, any familiarity with C++, Linux, Python, basics of cloud technologies, or it could be even iOS or Android programming, I think we are seeing internships across all of these areas at QPIT. And I wonder as well, do you need a background in automotive to excel here or can you come from other industries? You, you did touch on this during your presentation, but maybe we could just underline that. Absolutely. So um, I don't think you need to have a background in uh, automotive specifically or, or let's say to broaden it. You don't even have to be mechanical engineer for that matter. A um, lot of my team members uh, uh, are from different walks of uh, engineering discipline. In fact, one of my best architects, he is a commerce graduate, believe it or not, and he'll give a run for money for any of the other architects in KPIT and anywhere outside. He's one of the best embedded architects that I have. So that kind of exemplifies that if you have a basic learning acumen and analytical skills and problem solving skills, it just doesn't matter. So yes, it's not necessary that you have to have automotive experience. You could be telecom uh, uh, expert, you could be medical, you could be working in medical electronics domain, or you could be working in, let's say, set-top boxes, televisions, you could be working in gaming, um, you could be working in, uh, uh, I don't know, complex uh, uh, time-critical systems like, let's say, other transportation domains, it doesn't matter. Also, your engineering or your education is also not a constraint, I would say. Basically, what it needs is sound engineering approach, uh, sound programming skills and problem solving skills. 
Fantastic. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. I see we've still got some questions to answer, um, but I guess, uh, Omka, it would be a good idea for them to send in any questions that weren't answered to the email address on that slide there. Absolutely. Please do send in your questions uh, uh, at this email address that you see uh, on this particular slide. Uh, we'll be happy to collect all of those and respond to you one on one. Uh, so we'll try to answer all of those questions. We'll also, of course, commonalize those questions because there may be a pattern, but uh, we would strive to get back to you uh, through this interface. And of course, feel free to apply through the link posted here. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think with that, I bring the session to a close now. Thank you very much, Omka, for sharing your insight and talking us through that today. And thanks also to KPIT for supporting the event. Just a quick reminder that the slides and an on-demand version of the webinar will be sent out to you. Uh, that's all for today's session, though. So thank you all for listening in and goodbye for now. Thank you and goodbye, everyone.